John Palmer joins me this week for a brewing Q&A and to discuss his upcoming book. This is Beer Smith Podcast number 264. This is Beer Smith Podcast number 264 and it's late August 2022. John Palmer joins me this week for a brewing Q&A. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for homebrewers and beer lovers. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And also the Brew Commander, the new brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent-pending Brew Commander is a high-quality brew house controller that offers automated step mashing, boil timers, precision temperature control, and advanced settings. Command your brew day with new brew commander. To order yours today, visit BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And I launched a new version of the Beersmith Forum last week, as well as made significant security upgrades. The Beersmith Discussion Forum is a place where you can discuss all things brewing, including techniques, ingredients, equipment, pro brewing, and our Beersmith recipe software. Join the conversation today at Beersmith.com slash forum. Again, that's Beersmith.com slash forum. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome back John Palmer. John is the author of the top-selling homebrew book in the world, How to Brew, as well as a definitive book on brewing water, uh, also brewing classic styles. Today he joins us to talk about his new book, as well as a homebrewing Q&A. John, it's, uh, it's great to have you back on the show. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing very well. Thanks. It's great to be here. I, Blickman and I missed you at uh, at Homebrew Con. We uh, we're really happy to have you uh, back and healthy again. I guess. Thanks. Yeah, I missed. I was. It was a real shame missing Homebrew Con this year. Uh, I was, you know, all ready for it, and then I uh, came down with COVID after a, a international competition I was at, and um, by the time Homebrew Con actually, you know, started, I was, you know well on my way to recovery but you know the quarantine period in terms of uh still being able being contagious so you just couldn't risk it well ba wouldn't risk it you know so. well uh, we're really happy to have you back and glad you're in good health and uh i understand you are now in the middle of writing a new book uh yeah. focused on brewing on smaller systems i think yeah it's titled how to brew in your kitchen and um having my own children uh, get their own apartments and seeing those apartments and the uh, space and, um, you know, equipment that are typically in them. um, It it gave me a better understanding of today's new home brewer. Um, And so, yeah, I I said, okay, you know, what's the, what's the batch size? What's the, what's the brewing method that worked best in these small apartments? on a typical, you know, electric range, um, or hot plate. I mean, many, many apartments don't have, you know, a full kitchen and they have a hot plate that they do the majority of their, uh, cooking on and, or they may not do much cooking. Um, they may actually, you know, do takeout for most of their meals. So, you know, trying to, trying to tailor the home brewing process to this new, uh, environment. And you're, uh, you're of course, in California where uh, space is at a premium, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, my son just uh, moved. He was in New York City for this past year. And so seeing his accommodations and, uh, you know, roommate status and so on, it gave me a better appreciation for today's young adult. So, so John, do you think we're coming full circle here? Because you and I uh, probably both started uh, brewing on a stovetop when we first started, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's funny, the stoves have changed. Um, You know, we we learned on, you know, the electric coil burner, and then maybe we graduated to gas. Um, Electric coil burners are still out there, but in many cases, uh, they've moved, you know, like radiant top stoves are like um, the new standard. uh, um, I think they have induction stoves too, right? Yeah, and induction are are then also very uh, state of the art. Um, gas is is being actively discouraged here in Los Angeles due to mm-hmm. emissions. 
Um, but yeah, the, the radiant stoves in particular, I've had a couple people email me um, asking me to uh, issue a warning to new brewers, you know, putting a large pot on you know, a radiant top stove, you know, these glass surface stoves that are very easy to clean up. But yeah, you can, because of the large surface area and, you know, you're running at high heat for, you know, an extended period of time. Uh, the glass can crack and discolor. Really? Yeah. yeah. So wow. uh, I think I, I've actually included in this new book, you know, warning, you know, if you have a radiant or have one of these glass top stoves, not to use it, uh, you and buy yourself an induction hot plate for like 75 bucks, you know, and that will work just as well, if not better, without, you know, destroying a piece of equipment. <laughs> Uh, do the induction ones work well? I, I know at one time I had an induction stove. Yeah, induction works really well. I think, um, you know, the technology's improved. The cookware has improved uh, to, you know, be an induction ready. Mm -hmm. um, our good friend uh, John Blickman has uh, a whole line of, well, the Anvil kettles are induction ready. Hmm. And um, they they work very well. I've I was doing some test brews for the for the new book uh, with those, and they heat up quite well. And you know, eighteen hundred watts and uh, reach a boil, no problem. And of course, the other trick with stovetop is to go much smaller, right? Yeah. So you, you know, most electric stoves um, top out at eighteen hundred watt elements. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them are even smaller, like twelve hundred or fifteen hundred. Um, and so even at, even at, well, at 1500, let's say, uh, for three gallons, it'll take half an hour or more to come up to a boil. Wow. Um, and so, yeah, three gallons is really about the limit of what you can boil in a reasonable amount of time on, you know, an electric stove. Uh, like I say, you know, and going with induction, which is, a uh, a, a more, uh, more efficient heat in terms of transferring directly to the bottom of the pot mm -hmm. um, versus uh, coils and especially versus gas. Gas will, you know, they're, they're rated in terms of BTUs and the big burner on a gas stove may be, you know, 20,000 BTUs. Um, but a lot of that heat is lost to the sides. It's lost to the air. Right. So uh, even the, the, you know the stand. You, so you almost have to go to a, propane, a standalone propane burner, uh, which uses more more heat. And you're talking about 100,000 BTUs to get a good rolling boil on a, on a five gallon or ten gallon batch. Um, but yeah, dialing it back to a smaller batch size, a more manageable batch size for the apartment dweller uh, and really for the beginning brewer is is kind of the trend. Are you also covering a lot of the new uh, all-in-one systems in your new book? Yeah, I mentioned those uh, because, yeah, those are the other way uh, that um, many new brewers are getting into the hobby. And, and I, you know, I, I, having brewed on an all-in-one for the last couple of years, I really do like them. Uh, you know, smaller footprint, uh, single vessel to clean up, um, which is nice. I mean, I, I love my my big, you know, Blickman tower of power system. Uh, but at the end of the day, that meant, you know, three, uh, large kettles that I had to carry out, dump and, and scrub, you know, in the driveway to, to before I put everything away. So a lot more cleanup involved compared to the, to the all in one systems. And, uh, w you know, what's been your ex experience with the, I mean, these, these all in one systems are starting to take over the market to a large degree. Uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of them are very inexpensive in the few hundred dollar range and really offer a variety of features, pumps, uh, like you said, ease of use, uh, uh, you know, kind of a nice size as well. Yeah. Um, the, the, the nice thing about them is that, as you say, they often have a recirculation pump, uh, included in the system. Um, and recirculation is nice, especially in these in these uh, taller, you know, more vertical systems, uh, because it'll, it, it homogenizes the, the temperatures while you're mashing. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. So um, the only drawback to immersion pumps is if you they get clogged, um, and sometimes you have to you know stop mid brew and take it apart and clean it and put it back together. Um, the but yeah, they just you know the 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 footprint for storage of these uh, all in ones is very nice. You know, can just sit in the corner. Um, you know, a couple feet of space. And uh, if you have 220, uh, you know, capability like I do in the garage, you know, I just plug it in by the washing machine um, into the 220 outlet there. Then I, you know, I can brew a full size batch on that and just sit, sit in the all in one on top of the dryer, you know, it's, it's, and near the laundry sink. It's a very uh, uh, easy place to brew. Um, and leave the mess in the garage rather than the kitchen. But going back to the kitchens, you know, uh, the three and the three gallon size or like the, the five gallon all in ones do really well at making a three gallon batch. Um, and those will work on 120, um, or 110 volts and, uh, you know, bring, bring it to a boil in 20 minutes. Um, and uh, you know, have the heavy brew day, brew day done in just a couple hours. It's it's pretty convenient. Now, are there any special challenges when brewing? You know, a really small batch. You have to play with the recipes. You have to, uh, you know, be concerned about uh, certain certain factors. Well, um, the the new book is going to focus on uh, brewing a bag as the the baseline. Mm-hmm. And it's also going to uh, take no sparge as the baseline. Again, trying to simplify things for the new brewer. Um, so the basic system is a five-gallon kettle on the stove or hot plate with a five-gallon paint strainer bag or brew bag set in the pot in the, in the kettle. Um, dump in your grains, mix, cover, you know, if you take a temperature reading to find that, you know, your temperature has dropped a little bit. Uh, the fact that you're on a stove means you just lift up the bag, turn on the burner, heat it up a little bit, stir and cover it again. So it's really simple that way. Um, now I'm afraid I've lost your question. That's, that's okay. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, where can uh, where can people find the new book? I know you're just starting. Uh, you're just about to submit it, so it's probably still six months away. Uh, but who are you doing it with, and um, and when do yeah. you think it might be published? Yeah, I'm doing it through Bruce Publications, uh, so the same same uh, publisher as How to Brew, and uh, so it should be available in about six months. All the usual homebrew shops and online uh, stores, um, as well as Amazon. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to be a smaller book, about 150 pages. Uh, it's kind of a distillation of the larger How to Brew, if you will. Uh, mm-hmm. Again, focusing on these smaller batches and uh, making things more concise for the beginner. I realized that uh, you know How to Brew has become quite the quite the tome. Yeah. Uh, I think it's to over. Is it over 500 time. pages now, John? Yeah. 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 So, yeah, going to a smaller book size, make it a little more accessible. Um, because, frankly, I mean, you know, anytime nowadays any of us wants to learn something new, where do we go? YouTube. Yeah. 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 And so I think, I think we're seeing that as an industry is where uh, book sales have declined all over in favor of, you know, uh, electronic media. Yeah. And I mean, even uh, you and I did a video series back in, I don't know, it was 2012, 2013. And um, right. those aren't selling anymore either because everybody's on YouTube, right? They'd rather right, watch a right. two minute video than uh, than something more involved. But yeah. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, jo- just way- go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, John. Oh, I was just saying, yeah, it's just the way that, you know, the way we take in information has changed and uh, and attention spans have changed. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, one thing I was going to say a minute ago is, um, when we, our previous com- uh, previous topic was mm-hmm. the the trend downward in batch size. You know, when you and I started brewing in the you know early '90s, uh, there wasn't the the selection of beer, and so we were brewing larger batch sizes. Um, 
one, because that was what we were told to brew, but also because by brewing a five or 10 gallon batch, we could uh, have a beer style of beer that was harder to obtain for a longer period of time. Sure. Um, whereas these days, uh, you know, every beer <laughs> we could want is readily available to get, you know, the local grocery store. Um, so there isn't the, isn't the need for large batches. Um, if we want to brew something we can't obtain, you know, a small batch works until we can, until we decide to, you know, drive across town to the store that has that same style that we, we want. So I think, yeah, the pressures on, uh, and the drive, you know, how we brew beer have changed a lot as well in the last 20 years. Well, how has the uh, equipment evolved since you first started brewing? I think we've gone through several phases of equipment, really, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, from, from the early days where we had to make everything ourselves to now we have these, these all-in-one systems that are, you know, PID-controlled or computer-controlled, um, you know, very easy to do program temperature uh, mashes. Uh, you can do multi-temperature step mashes. But, again you know, modern ingredients don't need multiple, you know, multiple temperatures. You really only need that single infusion mash uh, temperature to get full extraction, uh, to get a very, you know, a very high quality wort. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that, that's changed as well. Hmm. Um, it's amazing. It's amazing, you know, how much it's changed. Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, like you said, I, I built most of my own equipment up front uh, when I started and, and you know, eventually evolved to a commercial setup, uh, again, a fairly large one. And and now, of course, the trend is very much towards the small all-in-one systems. So. Yeah. Um, well, what about the trend for many brewers to jump right into all-grain brewing uh, without going to extract brewing first? I mean, that's certainly a huge change. Yeah, it is. And I, it's, I think it's driven on two fronts. One, the United States really, and probably Australia, are they really only the only two countries that have a lot of malt extract available these mm. days? Um, the, in uh, you don't find the, as much emphasis on malt extract elsewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. It's you know used. It's almost used entirely. Uh, behind the scenes in industry, you know, baking and so on, sweeteners. Um, so it's just not available uh, to the populace. Um, so yeah, malted grain and the, and the equipment, you know, versus having to, you know, buy a cooler and build a manifold or a false bottom yourself. Now you can buy an all-in-one that's ready to go. You just, you know, get the grain pre-crushed at the shop, dump it in, hit the button and let her rip. Um, you know, it, it's really all grain brewing has become greatly simplified. Uh, so there's really almost no advantage to using malt extract anymore, other than the, the, the kit is filled it physically smaller when you buy it. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, I've had you on before to talk about yeast and yeast starters, but I wanted to uh, get you to comment maybe on some of the new yeast varieties coming out. Um, and I've got a few listed, but, uh, you know, Quebec yeast, for example. Yeah. The Quebec yeasts are really, uh, really a game changer. Um, and I, I know that um, I've been brewing with them more and more. Um, my, I had to get rid of my dedicated fermentation fridge. Uh, because it was taking up room and using lots of electricity, according to my wife. And uh, so while part of the year, um, you know, during the winter months, uh, I can brew at ambient temperatures, which will be you know, about 65 degrees in the garage. Um, it's, you know, it will warm up into the 80s and 90s at times. And I found it very convenient to brew my IPAs, even my lager beers using kvike yeast, mm -hmm. which, you know, ferment cleanly at 90 yeah. and 95 degrees. Yeah, you can leave uh, them in the garage, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's, and they're, and they're done so quickly. You know, it, it's, uh, it is quite nice. Um, and I, 
even for, for me here in Southern California, but when you look at home brewers in more equatorial regions around the world, um, it's a complete game changer for them. Yeah. I mean, they, you know, the loggers were almost unobtainable. And now with, with these yeast, they can brew lager like beers. And I say lager like because they're, they're clean, but they still have some pike yeast characteristics, which, um, overall are, are quite nice. I mean, they're not strange, uh, comparatively as say a Brett yeast, uh, would be, um, you know, in terms of the, uh, you know, uh, fermentation flavors. And sure. Such. Sure. Um, and what do you think about some of the new yeasts that are enhancing things like thiols and a lot of the fruity IPA flavors that we're, we've been, uh, looking for, for a long time? Yeah. Um, the whole that that's a really interesting area of uh, brewing technology these days. And I, at the Brewing Summit, I heard a couple of papers um, where they tr- deliberately tried to, you know, uh, invoke or you know promote um, glycosides, glycoside release, you know, thiol release, thiol bio, bio transformation, and. Um, Experimentally, mm-hmm. it's inconclusive, um, and the data kind of suggests that, that biotransformation, as we imagine it, is not a primary contributor to um, the tropical uh, fruit type flavors. That's interesting because I, I you know, I've had Stan on a number of times. He he said the science uh, does support. A lot of this, but it, you know, it's it's very uh, it's very it's very much uh, evolving. But um, yeah, you know, I think thiols play a very important role. The other the other ones that seem to play a very important role, things like geraniol and linalool, yeah. um, do biotransform into at least some of the fruity compounds. And I I apologize, I don't remember the compounds off the top of my head, sure. but I'm sure Stan could list them for you. Yeah. Um, but I do find it yeah. interesting that some of the yeast makers are now starting to target uh, these particular, um, uh, you yeah. know. Uh, thing features of the yeast itself and and give us some more avenues perhaps to achieve these things yeah and and there's going and the the gmo if you will but not quite gmo more of the uh selective breeding and gene editing which is you know a level or two below you know genetic modification of yeast um can enhance these properties um, yeah, and, and there are, there stuff. there is a there is a split approach on that. I mean, some of the some of the yeast makers do not want to get into any GMO uh, yeast, obviously, and some of them are starting to toy with it. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah, but well, um, it's, and even there, they're, they're going back to you know basic animal husbandry, where they're promoting you know the cross breeding of di- different strains to you know to achieve these characteristics, right? Right. Which is you know, and that's that's another avenue, but. Um, there is, uh, I'm, there's been some papers where, you know, they're dry hopping at 10 pounds per barrel equivalently, and yet only getting a very modest uh, expression of some of the, the compounds, in, you know, in question right, like the right, thiol right. Yeah. and the glycosides. So it, there's, I think, yeah, there's, there's a lot more work has to be done before we know, you know, maybe it's a, uh, a complement, uh, a complementation, new word, of you know different, uh, different modes and factors that actually promote these these flavors in beer. Um, it's you know partly the thiols, partly biotransformation, but it may be a more physical um, scrubbing of yeast at, by the yeast uh, ad- adsorption of other compounds in hops uh-huh. onto the yeast cell that would otherwise mask uh, the expression of these of these fruitier uh, compounds. Yeah, and, I mean, it's, and, a, it's definitely an evolving area, right? Yeah, yeah. So, the, yeah, the lot, lots of interesting stuff going on, and I usually look forward to more papers. Yep. And then the other one, of course, there's a, there's a variety of new yeasts that actually do sour. Uh, so they ferment and sour yeah. at the same time, which is interesting. Yeah, I haven't tried those myself. I am, I should, because I, I, I do like, you know, like the Katarina sour styles. Uh, they're very refreshing. 
And uh, so be able to, to achieve that in a, in a single single go, you know, in a, in a couple weeks' time uh, would be a, a nice benefit. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool. Um, and, of course, closely related, there's a lot of, uh, of new science coming out on hop aroma survivability, uh, including, yeah. you know, how to uh, optimize whirlpool versus dry hopping. We're, we're finding out that some uh, varieties do much better in the whirlpool and some do much better in dry hopping. I uh, wanted to get your yeah. thoughts on that. Yeah, that that definitely is another uh, area that needs to be, I guess, brought to the fore in in uh, modern home brewing and, and well, in craft brewing as well. Yeah, understanding what these compounds are and uh, what to look for in you know classifying uh, new hop fries or existing hop fries for that matter. Um, you know, we we where we used to talk about bittering versus aroma hops. Now we're going to talk about, you know, uh, the hot side and cold side uh, hops, you know, and in terms of where to best express the properties of these hops to impact the flavor of the beer. Mm -hmm. um, well, since you're the water guy, what is the best way to go about understanding your water and optimizing it for a particular beer or style? Yeah, um, water, you know, water is water. It's it's number six on the top five priority list for brewing great beer. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't think that's true. It's uh, it's the largest ingredient, right? Yeah. But you know, it's one of those things where 90% of the time it's going to work. <laughs> so uh, the place to start out with water is to get a, get a water quality report and understand where you're starting from. And, you know, and that is understanding the six ions, you know, calcium, magnesium, alkalinity or bicarbonate, uh, sodium chloride and sulfate. And look at those, look at those qualities, uh, understand, you know, general concentration levels. The zero to 50 ppm is low, 50 to 100 is medium. And that's generally where you want to be for most brewing situations is mm -hmm. in the medium range. And then high is 100 to 150, over 150, particularly for bicarbonate, tends to be a problem. So understanding that basis and then, you know, looking at uh, what are we trying to achieve with water adjustment? What, we, what we're really trying to do with water adjustment is drive our mash pH mm -hmm. because with good mash pH, we have good starch conversion, and we set up the chemistry of the beer for a good fermentation. Like I said, 90% of the time, you know, a good tasting tap water is going to be, you know, within the range of good performance, and the beer will work. But it's the same as, you know, a, a, a home cook and a trained chef where the trained chef has a better understanding of the details, you know, and the spices and the ingredients and, you know, how all these elements come together to make a really great dish. Mm -hmm. And so for the brewer, um, yeah, you know, good tasting water will make a good tasting beer. But if once you start to understand, you know, the ion levels and how that affects pH and then start being able to drive those variables a little bit uh, towards, you know, perfecting uh, a style. Uh, that's where you make good, good beer great, but you really can't worry about that too much until you've perfected your fermentations uh, because from, you know, a good versus bad fermentation is a much bigger factor than water quality. And I guess related to what you were just saying, I, I, I've been encouraging people for years to get familiar with the actual ingredients they're working with, like the malts <laughs> yeah, and the hops. Yeah. I mean, because they all have very distinct flavors and we don't usually have a working knowledge of those flavors like we might be, might have with cooking, for example. I mean, using your right. cooking analogy, if, you know, I got a pretty good idea what butter tastes like and what milk tastes like, and what even what right. flour and, and all these other things taste like. And you just don't have that expert knowledge. Um, when right. it comes to brewing, your comments? 
Yeah. Oh, that, that's, that is a great analogy. Uh, well, they extend it because um, look at flour, different grades of flour in baking, you know, uh, all purpose flour. Yeah, it works. But if you're baking a, a really light, fluffy cake, then you want cake flour, you know, to get the best expression of that, of that type of cake. Um, yeah. And so uh, malt, hops, understanding how these ingredients play off of one another, uh, proportions, um, all of that is, you know, critical in making that high quality wort that you're going to ferment. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, again, you know, fermentation trumps everything else. If you don't have a good fermentation, uh, you know, then the beer is just not going to be very good. So, again, water kind of is the, is the next step beyond all of that because you're dealing with uh, small uh, significance, or I shouldn't say, and, you know, a, a lesser impact to the overall beer than a good fermentation and a good recipe and a good understanding of the other ingredients. Yeah, a little more subtle, I guess, in the flavoring. Uh, yeah. But, exactly. you know, things like just changing a hop variety has a huge impact in many cases on the beer. Um, yeah. 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 Well, since you agreed to a Q&A today, I thought maybe we'd switch over to uh, talk about craft brewing for a minute. Um, sure. So one of my obvious questions, will the will the craft IPA trend uh, continue forever? Or are other styles going to start making a comeback? I mean, we've seen um, uh, IPAs now are over half the craft beer market and over half the product for, for most uh, craft brewers now. Uh, but I have yeah. started to see more see uh, more craft brewers just recently start to feature, for example, a lot more uh, lagers. Yeah. I, and I think, I think that's just what those, that natural, natural cyclical uh, uh, transition from, or either, you know, you see both in home brewing and craft brewing where you start out, um, you know, with the basic beer and then start, as you learn more, you start pushing the envelope, you know, going stronger, more bitter, sour, barrel, you know. And then once you've kind of tackled those hurdles, um, now you come back to those more classic styles uh, and you better appreciate uh, the level of expertise that's needed to brew a clean lighter beer such as you know your hellas lager or your pilsner um and you see that in a lot of you know uh craft breweries where they've been doing the 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 ipas been doing the barrel age you know stouts and and oat cream ales and you know these uh you know complex by additions and then they take a step back and say, you know, how can I achieve uh, more with less? And they look back at the at the simpler styles, and they now have the skills and intuition to uh, brew these well. And uh, so I think IPAs are going to stay strong. But the fact that we're now seeing cold IPA uh, as being the hot new IPA mm-hmm. Cold IPA is essentially a cream ale brewed as an IPA. It is, you know, an adjunct beer. Um, it is, you know, brewed with uh, typically brewed with the lager yeast at warmer temperatures. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's a it's a cream ale, you know, brewed to, uh, bittered up to IPA levels. That's a very popular style. Um, you know, it's really caught on, and it, it's in its in terms of its formulation, it's kind of similar to the double IPA style, but with a higher level of adjunct. Um, again, dropping the body, uh, making it a, a lighter tasting beer. Um, but, uh, you know, and that, so that's very popular. And I think we're going to see a resurgence, or I shouldn't say a resurgence, but we're going to see uh, increasingly um, the, the overall market moving towards these lighter uh, styles um, because uh, really the American taste in beer has always been to these lighter styles, you know, American adjunct lager, Budweiser, Mm -hmm. Miller Coors, um, that those, 
that style has dominated the world for the last 150 years. Um, and so I, I think they're not going away. I think we're going to, we're going to, we've, we've pushed the boundary a bit and then now we're going to swing, swing our, uh, those boundaries a little bit back more towards the mainstream preference, which is for a lighter tasting beer. Mm-hmm. Well, obviously, COVID had a big impact on craft breweries. Uh, some didn't survive, but the numbers are still surprisingly quite high. Um, yeah, yeah. What do you see as some of the lasting impacts, perhaps? Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, it, it did mean the closing of uh, a lot of um, taproom-only uh, breweries. Um, and we're seeing can shortages. Um because everybody started moving to cans, um, you know, t- so that they could, they could take beer with them. Um, I have a feeling that's going to continue for a while mm-hmm. um, because we're also seeing at the same time, you know, the rise of, of seltzers and, you know, those are typically, you know, packaged in cans. They're certainly not, you know, putting large kegs. Um, so, um, yeah, the COVID is, COVID has uh, really accelerated the transition in, you know, with the way we package beer, the way we consume beer. And, I, um, yeah, but I'll have to wait and see it with what it does in the long term. But, it, uh, hmm. yeah, I, I think it, I think it's, it's changed the way we're, we're, uh, you know, consuming beer. And of course, it's had a, a big impact on homebrewing as well. Uh, and I think this goes back to your book, but you know, the trend towards uh, smaller batches. Uh, have you yeah. seen other changes? Yeah. Well, I've seen you know, the, in terms of kegging beer, um, there's you know now two and a half gallon kegs, one gallon kegs available. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, so it's it's kind of nice to see uh, the accessories embracing the, the smaller batch sizes as well. And, uh, you know, I, I like the, the two and a half gallon, 10 liter batch size because it's, it's a good compromise between uh, being a size that's readily, you know, consumed over, you know, a period of a few weeks by yourself or quickly in an afternoon with friends. Uh, you don't have to worry about the, the, the keg being um, a third full at the end of the day and then <laughs> gradually failing over time. Uh, which is always a problem for my, my brews. <laughs> yeah. uh, John, have you been experimenting with anything new or different lately uh, with your brewing? Most of my experimentation is in terms of understanding the, the physics and chemistry of brewing. Mm-hmm. So I'm doing a lot of small, small brews, small mashes, measuring wort retention, measuring pH change and all that kind of thing. Um, did a lot of that for the new book. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not too adventurous when it comes to trying new recipes and uh, new yeast. The Kvike yeast are, are as experimental as I've gotten in the last uh, year or two. Um, but I do, I do really appreciate um, the, I guess, the robustness of in, of yeast these days. You know. Uh, as you can attest, you know, when we started out, dry yeast was yeast of last resort. And now it's almost the yeast of first choice mm-hmm. in terms of its ease of use and its consistency. Storage. Um, storage, yeah. And, and a lot more variety. I mean, now we have dozens of varieties compared to, what, two or three when we started. Um so yeah, um, liquid yeast, of course, is is still going strong. We have a lot more yeast companies now, and uh, and and the new the new strains, as you said, you know the 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 souring the the the, uh, the yeast that actually produce lactic acid to mm-hmm. and sour the batch in one go. Um, the new clike strains with their different flavors. Uh, new crosses in terms of yeast, in terms of temperature range and, and uh, profile. So, yeah, 
lots of lots of possibilities. Yeah. Um, well, John, where do you see homebrewing going uh, in the future? It's uh, as we discussed before the show. I mean, it has been in decline a little bit in terms of overall numbers, but at the same yeah. time, we've had uh, a variety of you know. I mean, we have essentially professional equipment now, almost. Um, yeah, and and access to to really the same quality ingredients that the pros do, right? Yeah, I, you know, it's 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 nice. I think we're seeing the transition of home brewing uh, from a rather esoteric hobby, you know. Uh, where it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago, where you know, you had to kind of go all in on this hobby mm-hmm. to a much more casual hobby like baking. Um, you know, you remember, you know, 20 years ago when bread machines were all the rage. They were they uh, were quite popular about a year and a half ago too. But yeah, oh really? yeah. <laughs> so you know, I mean, during during COVID, it, you couldn't get one. That was a oh, was like, that's I didn't thought that. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, things have become more automated, more accessible. Uh, the smaller batch size means that, you know, you can you can make a batch of beer in the smaller footprint. Um, the kvikis mean that you can ferment that batch uh, well at in at higher room temperatures, you know, 70, 75, 80 degrees, 85 degrees, you know, uh, and uh, so, you know, it's, it, we're seeing home brewing become more mainstream, more casual, uh, because it's, it's so much more accessible. Mm-hmm. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if we see all in one brewing systems in target in the next couple of years. That'd be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, John, I appreciate you coming on. I, I wanted to get your closing thoughts though, before we go. Yeah. Um, I, I hope that as we enter the new this new age of information and uh, so on, that home brewing keeps going because it really is a, a fun hobby. Uh, it's it's a great creative outlet for people, and uh, but uh, you know, the more it changes, the more it will stay the same. <laughs> yeah, we're coming coming full circle to brewing on the stovetop again, right? So. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, John, I, I really appreciate you coming on today, and uh, it's great talking with you as well. I hope you're doing well. Um, yeah. Thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you, and uh, always a pleasure, Brad. And my guest today was my good friend John Palmer. John is the author of the top-selling homebrew book in the world, uh, How to Brew, of course, as well as definitive books on uh, water and brewing classic styles. John, uh, thank you again. Great having you as a guest. Thanks. Cheers. A big thank you to John Palmer for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And also the Brew Commander, the brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent pending Brew Commander is a high quality brew house controller that offers automated step mashing, boil timers, precision temperature control, and advanced settings. Command your brew day with a new brew commander. For order yours today, visit BlickmanEngineering.com. And I launched a new version of the Beersmith Forum last week, as well as made significant security upgrades. The Beersmith Discussion Forum is a place where you can discuss all things brewing, including techniques, ingredients, equipment, pro brewing, and our Beersmith recipe software. Join the conversation today at Beersmith.com slash forum. I'd like to thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm-hmm.